So welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Dustin Seaton, the gifted and talented specialist at the Northwest Arkansas Education Service Cooperative. And with us is Carly uh, Genois. Did you forget my name? No, I thought you were going to introduce yourself. <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Carly Janolis. I'm the science specialist here at the co-op. I actually work with Dustin. It might seem like he doesn't know me, but uh, surprise he does. <laughs> uh, so our, our job at the co-op, we get to work with all the public school districts in Northwest Arkansas, which are Benton, Madison, and Washington counties, um, and all the students and teachers in those districts. However, we are located in Farmington, Arkansas. And so welcome to the uh, 12 o'clock hour, the noon hour of the Real World Wednesday Guest Speaker Series as part of our first ever virtual STEAM Week, Northwest Arkansas STEAM Week. Uh, we hope that you will utilize the chat as students and attendees and teachers here. There's a Q&A box at the bottom, so you're welcome to click those box and interact with today's speaker and make connections with things that you're learning in the real, uh, the classroom to how it relates to careers in the real world. Um, there's no need to worry about unmuting or fixing your video because we're using the Zoom webinar feature. Um, so you are fine just being you from wherever you are today. Uh, sit back and relax and enjoy today's guest speaker. So with that, I'm proud to say we are joined this hour with Professor Tom Lowerman. Uh, professor Lowerman is an assistant professor and uh, uh, sculpture area head at Penn State University. He works within the overlap of sculpture, craft, and design. And his ob uh, objects, drawings, and installations explore the emotional capacities of constructed spaces as a visual, tactile, and visceral experience. Uh, Professor Lowerman received a Master's in Fine Arts from Cranbrook Academy of Art and his Bachelor's in Fine Arts from SMU Meadows School of Art. His work has been exhibited widely, including recent e exhibitions in Berlin, Detroit, Philadelphia, and Chicago. So prior to his arrival at Penn State University in 2011, he taught at a number of institutions, including the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and uh, SMU Meadows School of Art. And he came widely recommended as an expert in his field from professors at the University of Arkansas, the School of Art and the Art Education Program. So with that uh, said, please join me this afternoon in welcoming Professor Tom Lowerman. Thank you, Dustin, for that um, great introduction. Uh, much appreciated. And yeah, I'm going to try and represent the A in STEAM. Uh, and I'm an artist uh, who has had, um, I've bounced around and done a lot of different things, and I'll hopefully uh, describe that. But what I do currently puts me in contact quite a lot with um, students and faculty in uh, engineering and also in um, the sciences. And so I'll talk a little bit about sort of how I ended up um, where I am and also uh, address some of the really wonderful questions that were sent to me in regard to this uh, uh, presentation. And so um, should I go ahead and share a screen? I have some images and things I'd like to, um, to use. So I'm seeing uh, head Ooh. nodding yes. Um, yeah, so let me see. Uh, okay, so slideshow from beginning. Okay, so can everybody see my, uh, there should be a pair of hands on screen, yeah? Thumbs up, awesome. Yep. So the first question was how you got interested in your profession. And I guess I have two professions. One is artist and one is educator, but they're totally intertwined and inseparable. So I'll, I'll treat it as one, but I'll maybe talk about how I got interested in art. And this is a, a kind of a strange video, but it's, a, it's a, almost a sort of reenactment. When I was a kid, when I was about five years old, uh, I think to get me out of the house, my mom put me in like a ceramics course at our local uh, sort of school. Uh, summer program. And I was just fascinated with the ceramics course uh, as a five-year-old. I have um, a son who's five and a daughter who's nine. When she was five, I made her sort of reenact this funny thing of just cleaning out this basic uh, elephant ear sponge, which is a natural sponge that has uh, clay in it. Because one of my first memories of doing art and being really interested in art and materials and science and, and things like that was taking the ceramics class. And what's strange about it to me is what I really remember is like cleaning up at the end of the day uh, rather than what I made. I'm sure whatever I made is maybe in my mom's closet somewhere, um, but cleaning these sponges out and watching the clay get diluted and run out and, and uh, change from a solid to a liquid and also have this natural sponge that looked like a plant uh, that had all these weird properties and the way that all that felt, it was a very tactile, uh, very kind of hands-on thing. And so 
me being interested in art wasn't so much about looking at all these fields that exist in the world as much as it was responding to touch and feeling and being in an art studio and feeling like, gosh, that's really something I would love to do more of. And then um, let me skip ahead here. So then what's maybe, uh, so that's quite a long time ago. And then somehow um, what I'm interested in now is 3D printing, specifically my area of interest is 3D printing with ceramics. So I'm still all these years later working with clay, but I um, am very involved in building uh, custom 3D printers that can make uh, clay objects with a high degree of resolution and fidelity uh, and sometimes in multiple colors and things like that. And so it's kind of a weird journey from A to B there with quite a lot in between. Uh, but what I'm um, involved in now uh, so much is uh, things like 3D modeling and as I mentioned, 3D printing, 3D scanning. And so I work with art students uh, to do these types of processes, but I also work extensively with architects and with engineers uh, and um, you know, colleagues who have uh, similar interests. Um, so I don't know, uh, that's, that's kind of how I got interested in what I'm doing. I can kind of keep on going with the questions or I'm happy to do this in a more, um, you know, kind of back and forth way, Dustin, if it's easier, um, you know, as people go. Well, we do have students from all age groups. And so mm -hmm. we'll, if you don't mind, we'll interject every once in a while when they have questions. Um, Absolutely. One of, the, one of the questions we had so far was how do you do 3D printing? Yeah. So there's tons of ways to do uh, 3D printing, but there's only one way that's really, I think, sort of hands-on user-friendly, which is what's called material extrusion. Uh, and that is um, very much, whether you're working with clay or whether you're working with plastic, it's a process of pushing a material through a little nozzle in a print head and using a computer to control that process. And so one way to think about it is, um, if you've ever used a hot glue gun, um, if you could somehow have a robot that held that hot glue gun and turned it on and turned it off and moved it very carefully from one layer to the next, that's basically what printing in plastic is. And printing with clay is very similar. Um, as you can see here, it builds up an object one layer at a time. So you have to design an object and then each layer of the object becomes a drawing and then each drawing is sort of stacked on the last one. Um, and so uh, we built this clay printer. I say we, me, and some students and some uh, engineering colleagues. And what it's actually using to do the printing is a cake frosting tip, like a little metal stainless steel thing that you might use for cake frosting. So in a way, it's like a, a very highly controlled uh, process of doing cake frosting with uh, ceramic material. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, no, thank you. And you're welcome. Um, yeah, keep on going and we'll just sure. have their other questions. So I pursued a career in art uh, and the question of why almost is hard to answer in the sense that um, I suspect myself and other people in the arts, uh, we sometimes feel like maybe we didn't have a choice. Um, you feel really strongly compelled to do something. Um, I was one of those kids that in you know first grade probably would have told you I was going to do artwork and then in fifth grade I would have said the same thing. In high school I definitely would have said I want to pursue art as a career and in college I never thought about changing my major. I only thought about adding a double major in art history. Um, so I, I'm not a good example of someone who, I, I've done a lot of different things, but they all kind of center around art. And I, I felt that very strongly as a kid because I would see drawings. Art class was my favorite in school. Uh, and so I didn't, I didn't labor over the decision. The only thing that's tough when you choose a career in art is that everyone you know will tell you it's not a good idea. <laughs> um, in a practical sense, because it's challenging right, um, to do art as a career. And so one of the questions that um, we had two, two people ask was, um, what was your favorite thing to study in art? Or maybe just your favorite um, kind of practice with art? Sure, that's great. I was going to talk a little bit about my education. So I did a lot of figure drawing, and I did a lot of printmaking. Um, and I did a lot of painting when I was an undergraduate student. Um, and so I studied uh, kind of traditional modes of painting and drawing and really uh, got into those. And then later on um, in graduate school, uh, got back into ceramics um, and sculpture and started to focus on those. So I would say at the heart of it all is drawing. Uh, my favorite thing was drawing in the same way that 
people I know who are musicians often will say their favorite instrument might be the piano because it's a great starting point for everything else, right? At the, whether you're making a sculpture or a digital process or what have you, if you can draw really well, um, it's just such a great uh, way to begin things. And now I've realized working with students in design and in engineering that drawing can be really important in those disciplines too, not just technical drawing, but uh, creative drawing. And so at the heart of it is always drawing, but I love materials. I love to touch things and pick things up and, and look at textures and things like that as well. And, and one question we've had consistently from students this morning, and we have it again in, uh, in the Q&A, Maggie from uh, Prairie Grove has asked, what made you decide to switch your major and do another one? Because often people say they went into college with one intention, but then they pivot and they go in another direction. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for me, um, I'm somebody uh, who really likes the history of art. Um, and as a, it wasn't a tough decision. I, I, you know, they make you take some art history classes as an art major. And I found that I really enjoyed those and that was benefiting what I could make in the studio. So it was a sort of natural progression to think, okay, how many more credits would I need uh, to just go ahead and, and pick up a, an additional major? And I maybe had the hunch at the time that teaching uh, might be something that I would want to do, um, which it turned out was true, but not for many years later. And knowing art history is really uh, a, a great asset uh, for an educator in the arts. Um, so, you know, there's sort of the technical, like, can you make things? Are you talented? Are you, are you ambitious in what you make? But there's also that whole part of, do you know the history of the medium that you use and what people do with this? I did want to mention um, there was a question sent to me in advance this, um, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were uh, in high school about your career? And um, I just had this huge blind spot that I really deeply regret um, for, for much of my life that as an undergraduate fine art major, as I wrote here, I had really no meaningful connection to technology in my studio coursework. So I was in school at a time where uh, a fine art degree was seen as a, a highly specialized thing. So you learned oil painting and drawing and sculpture in very sort of traditional ways. And those were wonderful classes and great skills to learn, um, but it just didn't introduce me to integrating technology uh, and things like that into my work. So I wish I would have known um, when I was in high school, how much technology would come to be integrated with art and uh, design. And I think back then, uh, something like industrial design was a field that wasn't even on my radar. But in, in present time, I work a lot with students in industrial design and architecture and sort of um, you know, design related fields that are, I would say, adjacent to studio art, but you know, that involve a lot of creativity, but also doing a lot of sort of client-based work. And I just had such a blind spot uh, about STEM apart from the A part of it, the art part of it. Right, I think we see that a lot. Just, um, just not seeing the the connection. Um, you know, as, as a person in, that's more in the the S of steam. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I sometimes I get a little bit away from from the A um, from that from that art piece, and it's. Um, I mean, just looking at like the Nobel Prize winners, where they you know had their their art of um, DNA, and being able to share that. Um, I mean, there is, there's such a strong connection in um, such a needed area. Yeah, and so I, I was really fortunate um, that my mom uh, was a math major uh, and she was the first person in her, um, she grew up on a farm, in a farm community and she was the first person in her family to go to college and studied math. And then she ended up at Bell Labs uh, with a, her math degree, which at the time was doing remarkable kind of cutting edge engineering and science and technical applications. And so uh, she just kind of stumbled into a career in the computer industry in the, in the mid 1960s, um, which was you know, a, a pretty small industry that was, um, but it, what was so amazing about that for me was that she was like this early adopter of technology um, who went from you know, growing up in a house without uh, indoor plumbing to you know, working on stuff that had relevance to NASA. Um, and so she, I was talking with her more recently, she would work on this, uh, this Fortran programming with these punch cards um, to do a lot of debugging and, and programming and things like that. And she found it to be, in her words, like really creative work and really um, exciting work. And at some point, 
you know what they wanted to offer her a job that was more management oriented and she said no no i'm i'm here for the programming like i want to do the code um not the interpersonal stuff so much and, and so i relate to that a lot and i also think about you know contemporary art that looks a lot you know like this and it's just funny for me to think about uh, I've come full circle in the sense that maybe I'm integrating a teeny tiny bit of coding into what I'm doing now. Uh, and I can have this interesting conversation with my mom, but it's taken all these years to kind of figure that out. And I wish I hadn't had all that, that blind spot for all that time. But most importantly, um, when computers came on the scene, personal computers, uh, my mom jumped on this. And I, I remember specifically her telling my dad, like, oh, we should get a personal computer and him kind of being like, you know, this is the 1980s, like, like, why would you ever need that? Uh, but thankfully, she prevailed. And so my brother and I spent countless hours uh, just banging away on these early computers. And he's, it's no coincidence that like, he's now in the computer industry, and I'm uh, doing art that has a real sort of, um, you know, digital component to it. So I've, I, what I lacked in school, I was so fortunate uh, that one of my parents uh, was, was really forward looking, um, you know, about what technology could be. Yeah, and that's that's what's amazing, and I guess why you came highly recommended is because a lot of your art is integrating the sciences, the technologies, the engineering side of things. But that's your background. Um, yeah. So I can uh, share some more things, or I can answer questions if there's more questions. Um, I'm happy to go either way with that. You don't have a preference. Either way, if I I, I see the chat, but I can't always follow it in real time. So if there's a uh, but maybe I'll just keep scooting along here. Yeah, keep on, keep on going and we'll do a tally of some of the questions and interject whenever we can. So one thing I thought might be interesting to this audience is, uh, and, and you had asked about, um, you know, sort of fun stories. And uh, this is a story about um, a, a place where art and design and engineering and industry meet. Um, maybe not the hard sciences, but, but certainly, you know, sort of applied science. Um, I had had a, an art career kind of going, things were going really well, and I got this wonderful opportunity to be an artist in residence at something called the Arts Industry Program at the Kohler Company in uh, Kohler, Wisconsin. You probably have heard of Kohler. They make sinks and uh, bathtubs and all kinds of plumbing ware and things like that. And so um, I got to work as an artist inside of their factory. And this was so fun and eye-opening for me as far as, um, you know, there was me and three other artists in residence, and then there were 8,000 people who work in a factory, you know, so it wasn't like an arts, you know, when you work in the arts, you often are in arty places. So this was fun to just be in the middle of a factory in um, sort of the middle of Wisconsin in wintertime. Um, and it's just this incredible place. So they make all the sinks and all the um, bathtubs and things. So there's a whole ceramics area, which is where I was invited to work. And there's a whole metal casting area where they're pouring bronze and uh, cast iron constantly. And they've had this history for about 40 years of inviting artists uh, kind of one or two at a time to come up and work inside the factory uh, and to make things using all the techniques that are in there. So I wanted to just kind of show that a little bit. Um, this was an artist named Ann Agee who painted all these portraits of the workers in the factory and um, different artists who have come in and used uh, the technology there, and just a little bit about what this place looks like. I'm really interested in um, in factories, in manufacturing, and in how manufacturing and digital technologies will will you know move forward in the future. Uh, even the opportunities that technology presents for kind of heavy duty uh, manufacturing to still happen in parts of the United States. Um, so it was just amazing to see this campus but to also see uh, what artists have done with this um, uh, at this place. And so there's a, as I mentioned, a foundry and a pottery side and you can make anything in here. It's just the most incredible uh, facility. So these are a lot of the artists who had come through and worked uh, in, in different parts of the factory uh, to make different types of artworks um, over the years. And just really quickly, uh, what I was able to do there, I was making a series of these cloud, these sculptures of clouds like this one. And I knew a little bit about mold making, but not a lot. And everything in the factory is made with molds. And we made this ridiculous mold. It was like 22 parts. I know I'm flipping through these really quickly, but the point is it's just these giant hunks of plaster uh, to make this great big 1000 pound plaster mold. And we were able to um, put, uh, a huge amount of liquid clay into that uh, and get this thing to, to stand up and to work. Um, 
and uh, to ultimately be this uh, ceramic uh, finished product that I just can't imagine trying to make this um, in a different location than that. So it was a wonderful experience for me to be able to um, you know, go someplace that just really unique in the United States to me anyway, uh, you know, like a, a 8,000 person factory where they work 24 uh, seven and to be able to interact with people working on the factory floor and also people in the sciences there. Um, they, they employ all kinds of people to uh, formulate the different materials and the glazes and to run all the equipment uh, and to try and do that as efficiently as they can, but in the highest quality that they can. It was a real eye opener for me. So we, we have some questions, some right. specifically about like, I, it looks like you've primarily worked with clay and ceramics. Do you do, you do or have experience with other um, mediums like wood or anything else besides those two? Yeah, I do. Um, ceramics is my main uh, material that I like the most, but I have worked uh, a little bit with metal uh, projects, um, whether it's sort of metal casting, because I know a lot about mold making. So if, if I had to, I can do metal casting. I occasionally teach it. Um, I could maybe even talk a little bit about my teaching as a way of uh, answering that question, actually. And so um, there was a question, what excites you about STEAM? And I, it's kind of a joke, but I like to say that one thing I really enjoy is to teach subjects that I never studied, um, which I, I find myself doing kind of a lot. I have a painting drawing degree, um, but I, I've kind of branched more into this sort of um, teaching with technology. So. Um, I have a funny role at Penn State. I think I, I'm one of the people that can just, they, you can put me in a lot of different areas. So I made this funny little chart of um, a bunch of different classes that I've taught and they range from drawing to um, sculpture to building ceramic kilns to digital fabrication, which is a bit unusual, but I've embraced that role um, because I've had a career that's taken me into a lot of different places. Um, I'm, I'm kind of enjoy that, but maybe more importantly, uh, one of the main classes I teach, which is called digital fabrication, I'm very proud of the fact that um, I get people from all over the place. And if I updated this, there would actually be more engineering students uh, than there used to be. They're mostly the 15% the here as other colleges. That's mostly engineering kids. But I, and um, one of the other ones here, Stuckman, that's our architecture school. So I've really enjoyed uh, working with um, people from different areas. And I love having a classroom where I might have a third of the students are designers, uh, maybe a third are engineers, and a third are artists who are sort of painters and, and sculptors and things like that. So because I work with these different people, I try and be pretty good at different mediums, but ceramics is sort of home base, the thing I always kind of come back to. I made this weird graphic that I know is hard on the eyes, but I was just trying to, this wasn't for presentation purposes. This is me trying to figure out my career at some point. Um, and so it's kind of like, well, what do you do? Uh, and I like to think about things I'm, I actually do, which are sort of like the blue in the middle here, like teaching, digital fabrication, clay, drawing, sculpture, uh, CAD design, machine design. And then the green being kind of like things, I, I work with people who do these things. I'm not an architect or an engineer, but I work with those people. I don't know much about coding but I know people who do, and I sometimes uh, interact with them. Um, and interactive art and game design, things like that are um, you know, things I keep an eye on, but that I'm not personally involved with. So I think you know, one of the challenges for students going forward in the future is I think so many fields are less, gonna be less specialized than they, may, they were in the past, that it can be very overwhelming in terms of what you need to know. And so I like to think about what do you actually do? What's adjacent to that? And then maybe what's a little bit further away that you maybe should keep tabs on, but you don't need to be an expert in or something like that. No, thank you very much. Cause that, that's what's really exciting about art is most people think it's just painting and drawing and some of the basics that we teach in school. But as we've seen in the 21st century, we're moving into 3D art, the coding art, um, new mediums and new technologies that I think is really innovative and exciting. Um, we did have a, a, a unique question that given the fact that you have such a long journey in your uh, art education career, uh, do you have the first thing that you ever made or do you remember the first like, <laughs> real piece of art that you ever made? Uh, it, it would be hard to know what the, prob the answer is probably yes. It's because my, you know, I, I, my, my parents, thank goodness, were supportive 
you know, they gave me a lot of warnings about, you know, if you choose an art field, that's going to be a difficult one financially. But if it's really what you want to do, you know, you can do it. Um, but you're going to have to work super hard. So they were, I have very, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm so glad because I have so many colleagues who say, you know, my parents just, they just worked so hard to keep me from doing this. And, you know, sometimes people want to do what they want to do. And um, sometimes they're really talented at it and they should, should do it. So anyway, um, I think my mom probably has like some pretty early drawings that I have probably pretty close to the first. Um, she, she probably has some of those. One thing that she kept that I, I think might be instructive is I got in trouble once in one of my classes. Uh, I was not doing well in a, in a language class and I kept drawing in the class and the teacher kept taking the drawings away. And so the, it got bad enough that the teacher called my mom in to have a conference about how bad I was in the class. And she pulled out this folder and kind of threw it in front of my mom, like, here's what he does all day. And my mom sifted through these drawings and she said, she couldn't help herself. She said, these are, these are great. <laughs> You know, like she was like really happy with the quality of the drawings and the teacher was like, that's not the point. The point is he's terrible in this language class. <laughs> and so I'm not trying to advocate not being a good student, obviously. Um, I just really struggled with language. Uh, and so I never did learn um, French or Spanish or, or Chinese or any other language. And I wish I had, uh, I really wish I had paid more attention to that. Um, but anyway, I, I think, um, you know, my mom has that little folder of, of sort of, you know, drawings that I got in trouble for. And, you know, I think sometimes you just really want to do something and you'll do it whenever, whenever the op opportunity presents. No, that's a great point. I, I know some artists have talked about the evolution of their art. Um, and, and I think that's a, a unique concept. Another one that I've, I've been interesting in lately is there's been some podcasts I've listened to on Freakonomics that said, can we separate the art from the artists? Mm. And, and I didn't know if that's a, a unique topic that you've dealt with from you as an individual versus what you produce or what artists produce and what they say or what it yeah. represents. How, how, how do they mean that, uh, separating the art from the artist? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I would say it'd be in music or in, in cinema that if you have an outstanding performance or an outstanding song, but yet the person themselves does something um, oh, egregious. I yeah, yeah, like yeah, how yeah, can yeah. you rectify continuing to support the art and so forth? Yeah, it's tough. The, the funniest quote I've heard about that is that everybody would love to have a Vincent Van Gogh painting in their house, but n almost no one would want Vincent Van Gogh in their house. Right, right. <laughs> He's a really problematic person with, yeah. you know. Uh, Mental it, health it, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And um, I don't know, I also like to demystify to some extent that I can. Um, every profession in the world has stereotypes and and i think um you know maybe for good reason but sometimes there's a there's a stereotype about people in the arts as you know maybe being um particularly uh you know having some uh being difficult personalities sometimes and sometimes that's true but some uh, quite often it's not and you know it, it, it's an interesting thing though to, to separate uh, the artist from the art. Another thing that I think about all the time in terms of technology is um, separating art from the hand a little bit and how that is always, always is a problematic thing. And so when I worked with architects pretty closely, I was always how, so interested in how we don't have the expectation that an architect would design a building and then also build it themselves. Like we didn't expect Frank Lloyd Wright to be doing the masonry on the, on the Guggenheim. Uh, but in art, there's more of an expectation, you know, sort of rightfully so, that the painter is moving the brush uh, uh, all the time. But there's actually a great history when you look at the Renaissance and all these time periods in art where artists quite often had a lot of assistants and called in specialists to do certain types of work. Um, and so as somebody who works with computers and I guess sort of robotics in a way, um, you know, it's always this kind of looming question is like, does the art get better if my fingerprints get in there? Or... Um, is it okay to have an art that's more hands off? Um, and, and maybe the parallel question would be like in music, the difference between being a performer of the violin, let's say, or a composer of, of music on paper. And so I'm always encouraged by the idea that a composer of music who lived hundreds of years ago, you know, their, their art is being actively created still now. And, and as somebody who works with, you know, digital media and art, 
that maybe you know something that an artist makes digitally uh, has an interesting future interpretation um, that we couldn't even imagine, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we having the luxury of having crystal bridges in our backyard. Mm -hmm. A lot of our students have been there and they come back to our classes and they say, yeah, some of the art's really beautiful and unique, but some of them are like, I could do that or <laughs> like, sure. exactly. And so it's yeah. almost like we want to encourage them to go into these professions and exp explore their talents. But the same extent, kind of what you're introducing from an art perspective is it could be intimidating to some kids that don't feel like they have conf confidence in coding or confidence in 3D uh, printing that that's that may be a foreign world to them. How, how did you overcome that as an as a artist yourself? Yeah, I had a really, um, a really good conversation about this um, just the other day with the class. And we were talking about one of the things that's so hard about reaching out to different areas. And I think this is true probably across all STEAM interactions is when you leave your home base, you have to be able to go be a beginner somewhere else. And that's just so hard, right? Like if you're really good at drawing, you've been drawing for 10 years and people tell you you're, you're really good at this. And you've developed a lot of confidence. When you then say, oh, you know, the next thing that I make is gonna be a, a piece of sculpture or it's gonna be a, a, a film. Uh, suddenly you're right back to square one um, as far as your capability. And I would imagine the same is true, you know, if you're coming from the sciences and you're reaching out to art, you have to be comfortable saying, you know what, I'm actually gonna be pretty terrible <laughs> at this uh, for, for a period of time. And so I think, um, you know, having that rec recognition that, you know, you may not be able to be uh, excellent at a number of different things, but you could be excellent at one or two things and maybe okay at the other things. And that still might make uh, for a really good mix. It might still make uh, the work that you make more interesting uh, because of those kind of wide ranging, um, you know, interests. So we, we have a couple student questions. Um, one, were you in a gifted and talented program or, or a high talent program as a student yourself? I was actually, yeah. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't recall when that ended, but I know in middle school, I started being in a gifted and talented program. And um, at the time, um, one challenge that I had was I was one of those students who was really good with um, English and writing and arts and creative writing and things like that. I really struggled with my math uh, and, and sciences and languages, as I mentioned, and fairly severely. So I was a somewhat controversial gifted and talented student because I didn't have, um, I, I looked around at my peers in that, um, in that cohort and thought, these kids are good at everything. I'm good at some things. Um, and so again, like one thing that was so hard for me and I don't know whether I'm to blame or my education is to blame or both, is I couldn't think of the application in my life for some of the math and science. And what's comical to me is that I have now, I'm super involved with math and science in what I'm doing currently, but it's all sort of hands-on. And I had a hard time learning in a more abstract mode. So um, I would have been somebody who would have really benefited from a math program that had some tactile real world uh, connection and less kind of abstract um, relationship with, with mathematics. I'm glad you said that because a lot of our GT students often feel that pressure of being good in everything. And, and when they may be really good in one area or, two, or a couple areas, but um, I, I'm glad you said that because I think that is a myth that we need to help dispel among our gifted and talented students nationwide, but especially here in Northwest Arkansas, that that is a, a major obstacle. We had another question from a student. How, have you ever made a piece of art and then finished it a long time after and changed what it was about or, or the original intent? Yeah, that's a great question all the time. Um, I love revisiting things. And um, one of the things I really like about um, 3D printing and 3D modeling, things like that, is that you have these digital uh, source materials that you can kind of go back to. So sometimes um, working with technology, you want to do something this year and you feel like I haven't got the tools to do this. Three years down the line, your school purchases some new piece of equipment or something gets invented or becomes cheap uh, that you can afford it. And it's like, oh, that thing I wanted to do three years ago, now I can do that. Or that thing that I did that was really rough and bumpy or whatever, now I can do that and have a really nice surface finish. So uh, sometimes it's driven by technology, like, oh, I can do something I couldn't do before. And sometimes it's just driven by 
thinking like, I don't like what I'm doing right now. I feel like five years ago, I had this thread that was really interesting. I should go back to that. I know at the School of Innovation in Springdale, we have a, a lot of 3D printers and, and students that are working with making chess pieces and all sorts of uh, utilitarian aspects. But a lot, a lot of the times the printer broke or it, it didn't quite fit the design that they wanted. And so they just discarded. Um, as an artist, you have those same problems where you're, you have it all in, mapped out in your head. And when you're going to app, uh, apply it and actually create it, it doesn't come out how you want it. And you just have to start all over or tweak it and modify and adjust. Yeah, I think I have a great advantage um, being a sculptor and being really attuned to making things and, and working with my hands for thousands of hours. So I'm always having to fix our 3D printers and things like that. But I'm, I'm kind of that's kind of up my alley. Like I, I used to like to work on bicycles and things like that as a kid. And I like mechanical things. And so I've worked with um, with uh, some of our engineering students to develop um, our, our 3D printers that we use for printing with clay. Those are kind of custom machines. And it, I think the best compliment I got from one of those uh, engineering colleagues was they said, you know, you really ought to have some sort of honorary engineering uh, certificate or something. You're a pretty good engineer for someone with no training. And, you know, that really meant a lot to me as somebody who, you know, again, struggled, uh, would have probably done pretty badly in high school in an engineering course. But when it was applied and when I could see that the, the thing that was keeping me from my idea on the one side and realizing it on the other side was was a mechanical engineering issue. Mm -hmm. If I didn't frame it in those terms, if I just looked at it like, can I build this to be, you know, to do what it needs to do, then then I, I really actually engaged with that challenge a lot and really enjoyed that challenge. And, and to this day, you know, there are some days in the studio, I'd just rather work on, you know, tinkering with the machine than like I'm out of ideas or something. It's like, well, maybe I'll just go in there and try and make this thing vibrate less or move faster or, you know, uh, be more accurate, something like that. I like those uh, sort of mechanical engineering challenges. I think you might be, you maybe answered this um, earlier, but we've just had several questions um, just about, I know that you were interested in art um, at a young age. Um, you said like when you started the ceramics at five, which is amazing. I have a four-year-old and I just can't even imagine her doing that. But um but that maybe is more reflective on me. Um, but how, wh how old were you when you realized that you really wanted to pursue art, maybe in college or as a career? Yeah, so I should say one thing I was incredibly fortunate uh, with was I, I attended public schools uh, that had the, the most wonderful run of art teachers. I just got lucky. Like my elementary school, middle school and high school art teacher, I remember all three of them and, and all three of them being um, in my opinion anyway, just fantastic teachers. Um, and so I had already the desire to do that and that desire was met by those teachers and, and they always encouraged me. And um, I'm thinking especially if my high school teacher would, would um, prod me to do things outside of school. Why don't you submit a painting to this contest they're having? Why don't you submit your drawing to the yearbook club uh, to see if you could get it on the cover of the yearbook or, you know, and uh, so I had a lot of, um, a lot of support from my teachers uh, doing that. And so that created a kind of positive reinforcement, you know, feedback loop uh, early on. So I think I already had the inclination to do art and then I got that nice sort of, um, you know, push. Um, so yeah, I would say that I became really aware of what I was doing in high school, you know, because there is so much um, emphasis on, you know, applying to schools and you know preparing for that whole process and <clears throat> I became aware of the fact that you know you would need a portfolio uh, to apply to various art schools you'd have to present them with a portfolio of work and I, I think you know I became pretty aware of what that portfolio looked like and I was definitely you know by sophomore and junior year um, I mean I wasn't like building the portfolio but I had this awareness that like you're trying to make a body of work um, and, and so I wasn't considering, I think I also thought about adjacent fields, like something like graphic design, um, you know, and, and things that would be more practical. Cause there was certainly a lot of, you know, even then I could tell like, okay, you know, it would be very helpful if I could identify some jobs, um, that are related to this. And if you decide to just be a painter, you know, and you're going to say, I'm going to make my living just through the sale of my paintings. There certainly are people who do that, but they sure are. It's, it's a bit like being a professional athlete, right? In terms of um, 
that could be realistic or not realistic, but a lot of things have to fall uh, in just the right way for that to be a career that's sustainable. So I looked also a little bit at, you know, what, what requires art skills. And one of the things I'm excited about for your students is I feel like there's so many more fields now where a creative mind and, and someone with artistic ability could, could really uh, connect with a lot of design and, um, you know, computer fields that, that maybe weren't on the radar when I was looking at college. You know, there was more of a sort of, oh, you do art, you go in this category here. So we have so many students who work in game design and web design and user, uh, user interface design and all those things, you know, are great for creative people who like to draw and design. So a question that we often get from students, and I think this is a good one from Eddie, uh, what, where, where do you get your inspiration as an artist? That's a good question. That's a great question. Um, I could maybe, uh, maybe I'll show a couple of slides again um, as a way to talk a, a briefly about that. Um, just to, yeah, let me see. Is that where I am? That's where I am. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump way ahead here. And... I'm really interested and inspired by um, architecture, uh, buildings, the built environment. And I wanted to, <laughs> sorry, I swear I'll get there eventually. Um, ah, I'm giving a whole nother talk here in, in, in fast speed. Um, okay. So, um, I really like, uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I have a really strong experience uh, when I enter uh, buildings, when I travel and look at things that people have built, uh, not just sculptures, but architecture and things like that. And so, I don't know, I just love to look at cityscapes. I love to walk through cities. Uh, for many years, I lived in Chicago and I would just spend so much time looking at the older buildings there that were sort of made uh, maybe a hundred years ago, a lot of them by hand. Um, and so uh, I try and make a lot of, uh, you know, kind of geometric, kind of simple, kind of abstract artwork that really engages in surfaces and textures uh, that are kind of pulled from things that I would see in the built environment, you know, um, big public buildings, uh, older buildings, homes, you know, places of worship, just places where people have invested a lot of thought and energy into what something uh, you know looks like, what the texture and feel of that place is. Um, I look at artists who, uh, th this is an architect, uh, Louis Kahn, you know, who traveled around the world looking at different architectural monuments. And so it was interesting to me that someone like him would look at the pyramids in Egypt, uh, but still be sort of a very modern architect, but try and incorporate that kind of geometry. So a lot of the things that I make now are based on um, what you might call vernacular architecture, like um, architecture or structures for living that are made by people who aren't necessarily certified architects, but maybe, um, you know, if you look at um, indigenous cultures and things like that, how people handle um, the making of homes and structures. And so a lot of the things that I make, they feel like maybe they fell out of some sort of built environment or that they're a fragment um, from some sort of, uh, you know, architectural um, uh, place. And especially I look at, um, you know, bridges, viaducts. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to travel around a little bit um, in different uh, internationally and see some, um, you know, ruins from different places to try and understand different cultures through what they build. Um, so yeah, the, the built environment is, is kind of my thing that is a recurring source of um, inspiration for me. That's, that's really awesome. The, the cool thing that some of our students are excited about is the concept of the economics of art. Like as an artist, do you feel more in, inspired to do something for commission or do something for um, that intrinsic just desire to, to create something? And then once you create it, um, how do you part with it? How do you, um, would you rather exhibit it or, or sell it? You know, where's that, that line drawn as an artist and as an entrepreneur? These are beautiful yeah. pieces. What's that? So they're beautiful pieces. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, that's such a challenge in terms of, do you make client-based work or do you not? And I think that that's actually maybe one of the most important questions a young person could ask themselves if they're going into an art or design 
related field. And I, honestly, I think based on my skill set and um, my interests, if I was more able to do client-based work, I would probably be an architect rather than an artist. Um, but I, and it's nothing against client-based work at all, but I just, um, I'm just that type of person who, you know, I'm up at night thinking about a shape and I can't get it out of my head and I have to make that thing. And it hasn't got any relationship to anything anybody told me to do or is paying me to do. And I just, I never was very good at, um, adapting what I wanted to do to a, a commission structure. Um, <laughs> unless the person is like, here's a commission to do exactly what you want to do. Uh, which, you know, for young people, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, so I struggled a lot. And I did try when I was a painter to paint on commission. You know, people say, oh, could you paint my, my sister or could you paint my house? And I did that a little bit. And I just found it to be very hard for me personally um, to stick with it, to stay focused. Um, certainly, I know plenty of artists who, um, who can do that quite well and can make, it's just a great way to make a living if you can find some you know really good patrons who want to continually commission you to paint things or sculpt things then just run with that and you can have a wonderful career doing that so i think one of the reasons i gravitated towards uh education is um i do love teaching and i do love encouraging other people to do the things that that they are inspired to do and so i found um that if the choice was between making commissioned artwork or um, teaching as a career that I would definitely choose teaching. Um, I found that to be a better fit for my personality and for my interests. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, we have another question that I think relates to that. As a gifted and talented artist or individual, and as an educator, how do you teach students to fail? How do you teach students to make mistakes um, and accept the imperfection, especially in the artwork? That's such a good question. And I think it's such a challenge. And I, I worry a little bit uh, about where education leaves any space at all to fail. I feel like the, the fail space shrinks every year and for a number of you know perfectly good reasons. Uh, and so like I, when I can say when I was studying art, um, I was encouraged to fail and it was okay to fail and it's tougher now if I if I in my if if I'm in college, and I'm telling everyone in um, in my college class to go ahead and fail. I feel like it's it's harder for me to say that than it would have been in a time when college cost a, a fraction of what it costs now. You know what I mean? So I feel like there's a lot of economic pressure to not go into fields that don't have um, you know clearly demarcated like sort of markers for success. Uh, in that space for free exploration and failure and, and iteration uh, is just tougher to sort of procure that space and defend that space. Um, but it's so integral. I don't know any writer or musician or artist who will tell you that they just hit the ball out of the park every time, uh, especially as a young person, as a student. Um, so we have to find that space. And I, I wonder maybe people who teach um, you know, in other in STEM disciplines, might might feel a similar um, challenge. I know that I talked to um, a colleague who teaches engineering who felt like um, they really missed uh, the hands-on experimental mode of engineering that maybe their education presented them with a lot, uh, and that in their teaching they were doing a lot more sort of uh, rigorous certification and kind of benchmarking. And they felt like, you know, when I was in school, we were really encouraged to do kind of crazy experiments that quite often didn't work out very well. And we learned so much from that, but it's harder to um, quantify that as an educational experience. And I really, really worry about that. Yes, I mean, I think we could have a whole another hour yeah. talk on that <laughs> alone. Easily, yeah, easily. <laughs> yes. um, but we are kind of coming to our um, closing here, which is crazy because sure. this has gone so fast. Um, but just any, any final thoughts or, um, anything for our kids. And we are so, so grateful and so impressed. Oh, thanks um, so much. It's been wonderful to, to speak with you and speak in this context uh, as well, which is um, uh, really refreshing. And it's wonderful to speak to, um, uh, to young people as well. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I see, because uh, I have two little kids, uh, just kind of in early elementary school, and I see that there's a lot of pressure to conform. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure to 
kind of do what the other kids are doing and to weed out the weirder aspects of your personality sometimes. And I don't mean weird in any kind of pejorative. I just mean that, you know, whatever your field is, when you look at people at the top of your field, quite often they're eccentric characters, whether it's in engineering or science or art, um, it, quite often because they've focused so heavily uh, on something that is really maybe esoteric or may, maybe, you know, hard for people uh, to understand. And so I would just encourage people to embrace uh, what they enjoy doing and to kind of know or to have faith that over time, uh, something that might seem a little weird that you do, if you do it really well, might actually turn out to be the coolest thing about you, you know, um, and that it's okay to not um, uh, just do what all, all your buddies are doing um, when you're in school and, and that sometimes you have to kind of set out on your own and, and create your own little space to do, um, you know, different types of activities that maybe uh, for whatever reason you just feel really strongly about, but to not doubt your own interest in things, uh, to really trust your instincts when you find something that you just are very passionate about, regardless of, you know, what that looks like. Yeah, excellent advice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I know, speaking on behalf of all the students and teachers, thank you for giving us your time today. Uh, but on top of that, uh, I know students are frustrated that we have COVID and we're having to do a lot of this mm. stuff electronically, but we get to visit with you and you're the furthest <laughs> presenter today and you're, you're at Penn State University. We're here in Northwest Arkansas. So thank you right. again for giving right. us your, your afternoon. All right. But we'll Thanks host so much. you here. Anytime. Yeah, anytime. We'll host you here in Northwest Arkansas if you ever want to make your way down. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm planning to visit the University of Arkansas when COVID's over. And I, I can't wait because I know a few folks who, who work there and just rave about the place. And uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've passed through, but not spent a lot of time. And it would be great to, to get down there post COVID. Yay. Well, thank we'll you be very here. much. Professor. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.